All right, so as you may all know, I am not Gene Kim. I'm not related to Gene Kim. I'm from the same country, but I'm not related to Dr. Kim. Just letting you know. <laughs> oh, actually, my hilarious thing is my, my dad's side actually fled from the north when the war popped off. So you're not wrong. <laughs> you're not wrong. You're not wrong. So I, I was actually brooding over what I wanted to teach. And there was a question in the back of my mind that came up. And it's something that we all should know, but we don't know much about. Well, I didn't know much about. It, and is what really happens when you get saved, according to the Bible. What actually happens? What changes take place? And how does that change the status of the believer from a dirty, wicked sinner into a saved Christian? Which, to be honest, is just a saved sinner. Not much, not much of a difference there. So really, my, my, the title of what I'm going to teach today is what really happens when you get saved. Amen. So... As Christians, our, our starting point is salvation because before we're, we're saved, we're not in Christ. We don't have access to the Father. We don't have any of these awesome privileges and benefits that come with being saved. But after you get saved, everything changes. A whole lot of things change. In fact, over 30 things change, which is what I'll be covering today. However, it won't be all 30 because there will be too many. So... It's, I think it's the beginning of our relationship with Jesus Christ, and it's the starting point of many really awesome things that the Lord has in store for us. Everything starts there. Without that, we don't really have anything going for us. So before we go, go on and start, I'd like to pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for bringing people in to listen to your word this morning. There are so many other things we can be doing, and you know, Berkeley has a lot of things to offer. People could be at restaurants, they could be drinking wine this early in the morning, but they chose to come here to listen to your word. And I pray that you, you'll please bless them for it, Lord. Pray that you'll fill us all with the Holy Spirit, forgive us our sins, and shove me aside from the pulpit, and please speak through me as a vessel and a speaker and nothing, nothing more, Lord. I just want to be used by you. Pray that you'll help us to have an open mind and to get a blessing out of what your word has to offer today. In Jesus Christ's almighty name we pray. Amen. So this is going to be something pretty simple, uh, but I think it's, a, it's quite a blessing, and there might be some things that you never even considered when you, when you got saved, because I certainly didn't consider it when I, was, when I was teaching or when I was studying for this. So once we get saved, it's imperative to know what happens, because it's going to give us some, it's going to encourage us in times of distress. It'll help you realize what you've become, which is important, because now you're not in the same position as you were before. If you're, when you were a wicked sinner, you don't care how, about how you lived your life. You just went by how you felt and what you wanted to do. Now it's not like that anymore. You're, you belong to somebody else. You are bought with a price, and the price is the precious blood of Jesus Christ. So if you don't know that, for example, if you don't know that you have direct access to the Father, that the Holy Spirit utters your grievance to the, to the Father directly from your heart, you don't really have much of an incentive to pray. We, this is a privilege that was never granted before we have an exclusive privilege it's it's like having vip access to the lord Amen. to the throne it's it's like having a vip line you pick up the phone and he's right there Amen. but what what the, what's really cool is the phone the holy spirit it really translates your gibberish into something that's understood by the father and that's a privilege you, we've never had before so that's important and so other doctrinal things Important things happen after you get saved, such as the spiritual circumcision, the splitting of your soul from your body so that the sins of your flesh can't, you know, drag it down to hell. That's it's a really important thing that I'll mention later on. So doctrinally and spiritually speaking, we need to know what happens. It's really important. So part one is in relation, what happens to the Christian in relation to the Father. And this is, I, I summarize this as the privileges granted by God. And so let me start off with uh, the command in 1 Timothy, yeah, 2 Timothy 2.15? Oh, gosh, I always get those two confused. But we're to study to show ourselves approved unto God, right? A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Why? Well, it'll give us power. That's why we have, there's a lot of power in the Bible. So let's, let me define privilege real quick. I like the Webster's uh, 1820 Dictionary simply because it's, the date is closer to the 1611, right? So it goes to, it, it's kind of uh, expected that they would have better definitions for words that were used in the Bible. 
Now, I don't exclusively rely on it, and I look at the context, and e I would even look at the modern dictionaries to compare to see if it's, you know, if it's somewhere in the ballpark. But you, there are some awesome definitions that you won't find worded in the way that the Webster does. So it says here, a particular and peculiar benefit or advantage enjoyed by a person, company, or society beyond the common advantages of other citizens. As a citizen in the nation of God, you have privileges, you have favors that other people don't get to experience because they're not part of the kingdom of God, right? They don't have it because they're not saved. Now, when you get saved, a bunch of things happen. And Dr. Ruckman actually explains this using, you know, an automobile. When you, you know, turn on the ignition and your car starts, a bunch of different things begin to happen. But we don't see it and we don't know. Now, I'm not very knowledgeable about cars, so let me, I will explain that using food. When you take a bite of food, your mouth begins to work right away. You have enzymes that come out and they start digesting these starches. And you have your mouth, your teeth, and your tongue move unconsciously because you don't even think about it to make a ball that, that, that will go down your esophagus and into your stomach. And I won't get into any more details, but the thing is, basically what I'm trying to say is a bunch of things that you don't know are happening in the background. A lot of things are happening. I mean, signals are getting sent to your brain. Okay, I'll stop. But there are a lot of things that happen. And it's the same thing when you get saved. A lot of different things happen and you don't even know about it. I mean, I didn't even know some of these things. I mean, I read it in the Bible, but I didn't understand how it pertained to me. But all these things happen when you get saved. Number one is that the saved Christian has access to God's grace. Let's go to Ephesians 2, 8. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. And uh, after we look at verse 8, we'll also look at verse 18. So Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 uh, that's, that's actually one of the soul-winning verses that pastor teaches, and you memorize it so that you can, you know, sh you know, shoot your mouth off at whatever person you're witnessing to and say, hey, you're saved by grace through faith and nothing else. Amen? Anyways. <laughs> Anyways. Uh, so the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, it says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. We can infer that grace has to be something pretty good, right? And I'll define this in a second. It'll give you context of the definition that, you know, we humans put although this is the biblical definition. Uh, for verse 18 says, For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Why is that possible? Because we got saved by grace, right? So grace in the Webster 1828 is favor, goodwill, kindness, the free unmerited love and favor of God, the spring and source of all benefits men receive from him. Basically, a lot of awesome free stuff that the Lord gives us just because he's good and he wants to bestow it to, upon us. If it wasn't for him being kind, we wouldn't have any of this stuff. But because he's nice enough to give it to us, we have them, such as our salvation. You didn't have to do it. Why would, why would any God want to come down and be an in, become an inferior being just to have a mock, you know, just to have those creatures mock you and then kill you it doesn't make sense to me, but he was nice enough to do that. Amen. Hey, praise God for the grace of God. So we have direct access to God's grace. You'll never go to hell because you've been saved by grace. Amen. It's something that you didn't deserve anyways. And unless he says, I'm taking you out of heaven, you can't go to hell. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? You, you have no power over it. it. It really encourages me every time I see it. It's like, man, I messed up today, but you know what? The Bible says, you know, God can't take back what he's already given to you. Let's turn to Romans, uh, Romans 11. I really like this verse because uh, as, uh, as Dr. Ruckman would say, God is not an Indian giver. Amen. He doesn't take back what he's, what he's, take, or what he's given to you. He's not, uh, he's not bipolar. He doesn't change his mind all the time. Romans 11.29 says, For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. He's not going to turn his mind from the gift that he's given you. It's set in stone. If it's set in his word, it's better than being set in stone because that's eternal. <laughs> and another awesome benefit of this grace, the favor and goodwill that we receive from God, is that we, like I mentioned before, we can go and pray to the Lord at any time that we desire. We have that VIP line. Remember that. Just pick up the phone and say, Lord, I need some help. And he'll give it to you 
Because he's nice. He's got grace. He's got favor, goodwill, and kindness towards you. And it's unmerited favor. Nothing you've done will ever be able to pay for the services and goods God gives you for free out of his grace. So those are some benefits. Okay, that's, all, that's only one. We have a couple left. Number two, the saved Christian is adopted into God's family as one of his sons. So let's go to Galatians 4. Galatians chapter 4. Isn't it awesome? And I have a little thing about adoption. We'll talk about it in a second. But Galatians 4, 5 is the first verse we'll look at. And then get one hand in Ephesians chapter 1, uh, because these go in, uh, in tandem together. Galatians 4 and Ephesians 1. So we'll first read Galatians chapter 4, verse 5, and then we'll go on to read Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5. So Galatians 4, 5 says, To redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Them that were under the law refers to us, obviously, because we're now freed from the law. Now, what's awesome about this is that we're not under the bondage of this thing called the law anymore. And if you think about it, the Jewish people back in the Old Testament had to do a lot of things. In fact, there were books of the Bible dedicated to telling the Jews what they're supposed to do for certain things. We, don't, we are much more free to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. Yeah. We're not bound by those things. It's pretty awesome. We, we're, we serve Him because we love Him, and we're not serving Him because you know, somebody put a gun to our head or something. You know? Isn't that awesome? So Ephesians 1.5 says, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to what? The good pleasure of his will. Again, unmerited. Good pleasure of his will. Not because we're, you're good or because you, you know, you're the pastor's son or you've been in church for 10 years or you're one of the founding members of this church. None of that has anything to do with it. It's because God's good. That's the only reason. So he decides to adopt you. So now, the awesome thing is, uh, just in case you're wondering, we are predestinated in Christ, okay? This is a conditional thing. You're not predestinated if you don't accept Christ. Calvinists will try to go through all sorts of loops and hoops, trying to, they'll, they'll try to convince you that you don't have free will of your own, and, and we really do. I don't, I don't really know how to wrap my head around that, because to me, it just doesn't make sense. But again, we are, we're predestinated in Christ. So keep that in mind. God chose everyone in Jesus Christ before the foundation of the world. In Jesus Christ. Not outside of Christ. In Jesus Christ. That's the condition. In Jesus Christ. Please remember that if you don't know that because that'll help you because they'll start pulling out verses and Calvinists will say, you know, they predestinated us. Oh, but wait. In who? In Jesus Christ. There's the condition right there. Anyways, I really don't like Calvinism, um, as you can see. So one awesome thing is to adopt a child in the U.S., this is what you have to do. I had to look this up because I thought it was so interesting. Why would the Lord go through all the trouble of adopting us? Well, to give you some perspective, to adopt a child in the U.S., you need to become licensed to adopt children, which could work well for, in both ways because you don't want somebody who's, you know, who's, who's a lunatic adopting children. That's, uh, that's not good. So the process includes submitting an application, undergoing a home study, so you, you need to be trained. And now, I don't know what training they offer and what training you have to go through, but who knows. But you have to undergo a home study and attend training. You have to make time to go attend if you want to adopt a child. Now, would you go through all that for children that hate you? They Just imagine you have a group of kids that are calling you names. They're, they're yelling profanities at you. And they're telling you, you can't be my father. Would you want to go and adopt them? Would you want to go through the trouble? You have to, it takes 6 to 12 months. I think it was 6 to 12 months or 6 to 12 steps. But regardless, it takes a considerable amount of time and investment for you to go adopt a child. What was that investment in our case? Well, God, His investment, His adoption process included living 33 and a half years of a perfect life, which we can't do. We can't even live one second of a perfect life, right? But He, he did for us. And while being tempted in all points like as we are, according to Hebrews 4.15, so he was tempted just like you and I are, but he didn't make the choice to sin. I can't imagine how that even works because that's so amazing to me. 
I don't know how anybody can go without sin, right? Because we're constantly battling against all these thoughts and desires of the flesh, and we're saying, hey, stay down, you dumb thing. I want you to die. That's why Paul says, hey, you got to kill this thing every day. You got to tell it, you're dead. Stop squirming. You're going to go in the dirt one day, but not yet. So it's still, it's still writhing. It's like, it's like an eel. It's writhing. It's like, Argh. it's like, ah, I don't want to do anything that God wants me to do every single day. But you know what? Jesus Christ never made a mistake while he was here. I'm sure his flesh was, you know, writhing about, but he's like, no, I got you under control. I'm going to live a perfect life so that I can adopt you. It was personal. He knows you guys. He knows you by name. It's personal. So he went through all that, and he suffered, and he went through grueling torture. He went through mocking, and he had to take sins upon himself who knew no sin. He doesn't even know what it's like to sin because he's never done it before. He had to experience that for you. So he adopted you out of his grace. How amazing is that? So now this adoption thing isn't something to be taken light of because it's, it, it cost him something. But he thought you were worth it. So here you are. And here, there you will be when you die. Maybe, maybe today, Lord, maybe you're coming today. I don't know. But uh, I'm, just, I'm just saying, maybe I'm just kind of stepping out of my boundaries here. But Lord, maybe you're coming today. I don't know. You don't know when he's coming, but it's an, that's an awesome thing. You're, ado- you're an adopted child of God. What a status. We're going to go into more of that status in a bit. Point three, number three is a safe Christian grant, or for a safe Christian, God grants all safe Christians an inheritance. Now, the details of the inheritance, I honestly don't know, but we know we have an inheritance of some sort. Now, God is the richest being in all the universe, okay? Bill Gates might have billions of dollars. God has things that you can't even put money on, things that you can't quantify. You can't put numbers on it. He can create gold out of thin air and say, hey, you want gold? Here, I have a ton of gold for you. Literally 2,000 pounds of gold here for you. He can do that. You want those emeralds? Hey, hey, son, I got some emeralds for you. Hey, I got this topaz. I got the sardis and all this other stuff. Anyways, I, onyx, I don't know. I, there are a lot of jewels mentioned in the scripture, okay? And they're all beautiful. People kill other people to get those jewels in this world. You ever heard of the blood diamonds? People kill, exploit, and cause suffering to a bunch of people just so they can get some shiny stones. And God says, you know what? You can laugh at all those guys because when you get up here, I'm going to give you a truckload of this stuff. Amen. Remember, so you got to be good. you got to serve God, remember? <laughs> I'll get to that in a second about you know, the inheritance stuff, but more on the inheritance stuff. But let's go to Acts 26, uh, 18. I like this verse. Acts 26, 18. I should have mentioned it before I mentioned all the good stuff, but let's look at the verse that says it. Let's look at the very verse that says you have an inheritance. Man, usually inheritance is given when somebody's dead, but God's eternal and he doesn't die, and he can give us inheritance without even dying. Well, I guess he did die for us, so I don't know. <laughs> it's pretty interesting, right? What an awesome God. He gives us the inheritance. I don't know what it is. I don't know what all of it is, but it's something great. So Acts 26, 18 says, To open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins, which we've received already, and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Awesome. You have an inheritance. And this verse is going to come up more more than once, so let's get familiar with that one. This is pretty cool. And, and, And the word inheritance is mentioned many times in the Bible, not just in the Old Testament, but in the New by Paul. Some of which are Ephesians 1.11, Colossians 1.12, 3, Colossians 3.24, and some other verses. There are many verses that it, you know, mention this inheritance. And it must be pretty good because Paul's mentioning a bunch of times. And he's saying, hey, you want, it's like he's saying, you want this inheritance. You don't exactly know what's going to be in this package deal, but I guarantee you when you open this box, you're going to love it. So you better work for it. <laughs> so that's some, that's some good stuff. And it's eternal. Remember... The, the ants, the cockroaches, the, you know, the moths, they can't get to that stuff. It doesn't, it doesn't spoil. It, does, it has no time limit. It doesn't decay. How awesome is that? Now, let's see. Oh, yeah, so the thing I was going to mention is in 1 Corinthians 3, this is, this is uh, where we always go to say, hey, you've got you to work for your, your stuff. You know, God's not 
God doesn't believe in equal outcomes. God believes that you should work for your stuff. God, God's not going to just, you know, he gives you a lot of things for free already. So this, this is like extra icing on top of the cake, okay? So in 1 Corinthians 3, verses 11 through 15, let's read verse 11. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work what sort of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. You won't be burned by the fire, but you can lose some rewards. So you better be careful about how you live your Christian life. There are things you can lose. There are a lot of things you can lose. You can lose your health. You can lose fellowship with God, which is probably the most damaging one of them all. Yeah. I mean, don't you want to have a good relationship with God the Father who died for you? I, mean, I certainly do. We all have our shortcomings, but we, got, we still strive for the best, right? But if you stop even striving for that, then you got a problem and you need to get right. So that's number three. All right, well, that's three out of what? Like 17. Okay, four. As a saved Christian and a child of God, you are elected. As soon as one receives the Lord Jesus Christ as a Savior, he is elected. 1 Peter chapter 1. Let's go to 1 Peter 1. It's like a special status, right? And again, oh, I'm going to mention this in a second, but I, I don't like Calvinism. But I'm going to mention this later on. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 2 says, Elect, oh sorry, you guys are still turning, so I'll give you a couple seconds to get there. Again, I don't like Calvinism. You guys might know. <laughs> elect, so 1 Peter 1, 2 says, Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you, peace, and be multiplied. So you're elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. He didn't bend your will, but you are elect because why? You received the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Right. Now Ephesians 1, 4 has a similar... Similar sounding verse. So let's go take a look at that. Ephesians 1 4. So Ephesians 1 4. You have to excuse me if I'm a little slow as well. Um, Ephesians 1 4. Man, the book of Ephesians has a lot of good stuff. It's like you read it once and then you go over it again. And it's like, I didn't see that before. There's <laughs> a lot of good stuff in there. Ephesians 1, 4 says, According as he hath chosen us in who? In him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before in love. So this elect condition depends on your status with Jesus Christ. Did you receive him as your Savior or no? So keep that in mind. So Dr. Ruckman, I like this quote that you know, he said is regarding this. The condition for this election is obviously you receive Christ of your own free will. You know, he doesn't bend your will to make you accept him. Okay, that's not love. That's not free will. So, Dr. Ruckman says, No man is chosen before the foundation of the world outside of Christ. God doesn't choose anybody but the people who are in Christ, and nobody was in Christ before the foundation of the world. So the wording of Ephesians 1-4 is clear. There is a condition to this stuff. So keep that in mind. Don't get, don't get swung away into a different land by all these people who, sound, who think they sound really smart, by the way, uh, you know, bringing up all these fancy words and you know, twisting the scriptures to their own destruction. Don't, don't be like that. The fifth point, or the fifth thing that happens, is the saved Christian becomes a child of God. So the thing I focused on earlier was the adoption process, right? Well, now, after the adoption process is over, you become a child, right? You're officially an adopted child of God. Well, where does it say that in the Bible? This is one of the most powerful verses, I think, in the Bible for somebody who, who's recently saved, like a new convert. You give them this verse, they'll love it. John 1, 12. John 1, 12. This is, this is an awesome verse. I have a story to tell about this verse, actually. Um, but let's go, to this, let's go to the verses first. Let's read the Word of God, shall we? John chapter 1, verse 12. Oh, man. This, when I first heard this verse from, the, from my friend who led me to Christ, I was like, man, praise God! I get to become a what? You know, okay, think about it this way. People today, let's say in the army, for example, in the military, people just, they do all sorts of things to get promoted. They'll do dirty things. They'll stab people in the back. They'll, 
in the forged documents. I don't know what they do. People, I'm, I'm pretty sure somebody did that, okay? But they'll do all sorts of things to get promoted. Same thing at the workplace. People will do all sorts of things to get promoted to a higher status. You don't even have to do any of that. You have a higher status right here. You're a child of God. Can you imagine a higher status than being, the chi being a child, even though adopted, of the creator of the universe? He treats you just like your own, his own. Amen. Man, that's amazing. That's, we get that kind of status. Now, you know, when the Bible says you, it, becomes, it gives you the power to become a son of God, it might not strike you at first, but when you think of it in this context, it's an amazing thing. Yeah. It's like he's, he's drawing you out of the slums and into the palace of the king. That's exactly what happened to us. I was in the gutter, and, and God said, Hey, come here. Why don't you come hang out in my house? I got a mansion, and I'll build another one just for you. It's custom made with your name on it. Right here. It, and it's all yours. You just can't get it yet. But when you come up here to be with me, you'll get it. That's, that's pretty awesome. So it says in John 1, 12, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. To them that believe on his name. Notice the free will. You have to choose to believe on the name of the Son of God, right? Okay, First John, let's look at First John 3, 1. Man, I, I think my favorite book in the Bible is probably John. It's the first one I ever read from uh, front to back, actually. And so it... It's really a, it's one of my favorite books. And I think John has this character of love that, you know, that is kind of pronounced in his books. Like he, he talks a lot about love and the way he presents the story of the Lord Jesus Christ. I really like it in John. So 1 John chapter 3, verse, um, let's see. Yeah, 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. You're a son of God now. You're weird, okay? You're a peculiar person, and we'll get to that in a second, too. But you're not what you were before. You're not regular old Sean Lawler on the street. You are a son of God. That's better than any number of letters and titles you can have after your name. You're a son of God, amen? That's not... I've never heard of any other God affording that title to anybody. You read all these mythologies, none of them are going to be like, hey, why don't you come be my son? I'm good for nothing. And he says, you can still have the title. You can still have the goods because I want to give them to you because you love me, right? You accepted me. So here, oh, let me give you all these things. He's like a father waiting to spoil his children. The moment you take him as your savior, he says, let me just give you all of this stuff right now. So he's given you all of these things so far, but he's got more for you. Who doesn't want to serve God after that? I, name me a God in any literature that does this, this amount of things for the believer. Every other God that I've seen that I've read in literature, just they, they enslave their followers and you know, they're like workhorses for their pleasure, their evil pleasure, because you know all the other gods in the literatures are a bunch of devils, but our God's not like that. Our God says, I'll give you a choice to serve me. And he still bought us with that price. He had to go through all the suffering, and he still gives us a choice. Do you know what that means? He means that, it means that he's willing to go through all that, even if you just say, no, I don't, I don't like you, God, I don't want to serve you. Even if you act like a spoiled brat all your life on this earth, he's not going to hold it against you. Can you imagine a father that does that? Because if my kid acted spoiled for the, all of his life, I don't know if I could deal with that kid. <laughs> I'm just letting you know. But uh, God's willing to put up with that. So we should be willing to put up with a lot with the brethren, right? He puts up with a lot with you. Because can, have you ever thought of this? God, there are things that God thinks are natural for a believer to do. So he wrote them in here. He says you ought to follow these directions. But we fall short every day. To something, and, and have you ever tried to, have you ever been frustrated with somebody because you think this, they should do things this way and it comes natural to you, but it doesn't come natural then? We're quick to get frustrated and vent our anger out on people and to say, why aren't you doing this correctly? You should know better. You know, it's not that hard. It's common sense. God, thank God he doesn't do that to you. Thank God he doesn't say, it's common sense to stay away from sin, Tom. And I'm sitting here like, no, Lord, I know it is, but it's really hard for me. I don't think the same, on the same level as you do, Lord. 
And the Lord says, well, that's fine. I'll, I'll shape you to it. And if that means I have to beat you with a rod, I'll do it. Yeah, thank, God. thank God he beats me up with a rod and he says, no, you're not supposed to go that way, Tom. You're going to get hurt. Bam, go this way. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, Lord. Okay, I'm going this way. I'm going this way. And the Lord says, hey, you're going the wrong way. Hey, stop. Pulls me back by my collar. And he's like, hey, what are you doing, Tom? Go that way. He's done that with me a couple of times, okay? So I know that from experience. He's done that a couple of times. Whipped me a couple of times and yanked me from one direction to another. And this other time, I guess I was more receptive. So he said, I'm just going to nudge you in this direction and you will go this way. And I said, all right, Lord. Hey, hey praise the Lord. I, I was attentive, so I didn't have to, you know, get a little whipping. So praise God. That was only point five, by the way. Um, let me give you a little story. The reason why I like this verse so much is uh, John 1, 12 is because it, there's a story behind it. In 2018, I took a music appreciation class. Now, I know you're thinking, what in the world is he going to, what does this have anything to do with, trust me, you, you'll understand. One of the assignments for that class was that I had to go to a classical music concert to analyze, you know, what kind of pieces they're playing. Like, we had a bunch of criteria, like, you know, how, what, what was the tempo like? You know, what did you like most about the piece? And stuff like that. So then I went, and it was in San Francisco. I went to listen to that concert, and I was like, man, I was mesmerized. I love classical instruments. I was, I was looking, I was staring so hard at this bassist that he actually looked at me in the middle of the performance. He's like, why is he staring at me? <laughs> so I was like, I was like that the whole time. I was like, man, this guy's moving his fingers and his bowing is just perfect. It's like, man, this is amazing. This guy probably thought I was crazy because I was wide-eyed the whole time. <laughs> Fast forward a couple hours later, the concert was over. It's in the middle of the night. And believe me, I had... So I should have taken an Uber to the BART station, okay? That's my fault. But I was, when, I, when I left the area that the, uh, that the concert hall was at, I was kind of scared because I was like, man, this place is dark. I was quoting Psalms 23, 4 the whole way. I was like, man. <laughs> yeah, but I was quoting that the whole way. So I went on BART. Praise God nothing happened because anything can happen. It's, a, it's in the middle of the night. Literally nobody was on the street except me. I was like... In the dark, dark street, I was walking all alone and nothing happened. Praise God. There's some suspicious looking people all over the place, but uh, nothing happened. Praise God. So I get on BART. I'm on, it's, I'm on the way home and I decided that maybe, just maybe if I flip open my Bible and I read it on a public transit, somebody will pay attention. And it doesn't even, I didn't even think about it leading to a witnessing opportunity. I just said, hey, maybe somebody will say, hey, that guy's reading the Bible. Maybe I should go read mine. Or, wow, I guess there's still some people who are willing to read this book, and they don't consider it archaic, and it doesn't collect dust on a shelf, right? So here I am reading. I, was, I remember clearly I was reading Job 38, and as soon as I finished reading Job 38, a lady comes up to me and says, hey, what are you reading? And I said, well, I'm reading the Bible, and I'm reading Job, and... Uh, I'm, now I'm on Job chapter 39. And I was like, what is going on here? I was like, I've never seen anybody take an interest in this stuff. Yeah. So she says, hey, can I read it with you? I'm like, sure. Yeah, let me read it out loud. So I read Job chapter 39, I think 39 to 40. But I finished the book of Job. And I had read it out to her. And, you know, she was, I guess she was interested. And she just went back to her seat. Now, the thing that I found most striking about this was that it was late at night and she was very scantily dressed and it wasn't a, and it wasn't a warm night. So a lot of things are running into my mind, running through my mind, but at the same time, I was like, maybe this is the perfect opportunity to tell somebody about Jesus Christ. I was still a coward at the time. I think I'm still a coward, but I mustered up all my courage and I sat down next to that person. I said, hey, can I tell you something really good? And there I went. So, okay, now that sounds a little suspicious, right? I know that's why you, some, of, some of you guys are giggling, but hey, I went up to her and I said, hey, I want to tell you something really cool. You know, I, you know the Bible says that you can know where you're going when you die? Amen. So then I led her through the Romans road and I gave her all these verses. And at the end, she received Christ for her salvation. Amen. Here's the kicker. After that, I said, hey, let me tell you some other cool things God has in store for you. And the first thing I mentioned was 1 John 5, 13, about eternal life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life, right? So I told her that, and then I got to John 1, 12. When I mentioned John 1, 12, and I said, you're an adopted child of God now. You're not what you want, whatever you were before. She started crying. And what she told me was I had never, nobody has ever told me something like that before. Wow. Amen. And I had, 
to this day, I had never forgotten how much one verse can change somebody's yeah. life. And how amazing John 1.12 is and what, how, what number of things that the Lord can achieve with just a couple words in a book. But we know it's not just a couple yeah. words. Yeah. It's the words that came out of the living God. Yeah. This book has power, and I want to encourage you that if you share even one word with, of this with somebody else, it can change their lives. Yeah. That memory is so firmly ingrained in my mind and never went away. So I decided that any time I get to lead somebody to Christ, I'm always going to tell them that verse or something else, something else about eternal security. Because you never know what it's going to, where it's going to lead. So that was my experience with John 1.12. That's why I love it so much, because it was the most impactful thing that I've ever done to somebody else's life using the Bible. And I thank the Lord that he gave us the power to do that. We're not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power, of sal power unto salvation to those that believe, right? It's an awesome power. That was only point five, but I'm running out of time. Let's go to point six. Sixth thing that happens when you get saved is heavenly citizenship is granted to the saved Christian. Let's go to Philippians 3.20. Pastors talked a lot about this. Uh, he spent a lot of good time in, Phil in the book of Philippians, right? And... Uh, I mean, I went back and I listened to what Pastor had to say about this verse as well. Uh, Philippians 3.20, I'm going to just read it because for time's sake. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So if your conversation is in heaven, I mean, are you not a part of heaven already? Now, that, that alone is not very convincing, obviously. So let, as all scientists do, let's bring up the evidence, right? But our evidence, our, our peer-reviewed paper is this. This is all we need. And th this is like a billion peer-reviewed papers all in one. And it's never wrong. And its confidence value is always over 99%. It's 100%. A anyways, um, let's see. Here. So why is our conversation in heaven? This is something, these are rhetorical questions that I want you to ask yourselves. You don't necessarily have to answer, but let me ask you a couple of these. Why is our conversation in heaven? It might be because we're already seated in heavenly places according to Ephesians 2.6. We're already there. Now, how you can be in heavenly places, yet have a fleshly body down here at the same time, I don't know, okay? I can't take a picture of myself sitting in heavenly places next to the Lord Jesus Christ, bring it back down here and print it and show it to all you guys, because we'd probably all go crazy because of how awesome it is. Anyways, I don't know how it works, but I believe it. Do you understand how a God can manifest himself into three different personas and still be one? I don't, but the Bible says so, so I believe it. It's as simple as that. If the Bible says it, you believe it, whether you know it or not. You know, interestingly, in the book of Revelation, there were, there were verses about, about TV, right? How, you know, Moses and Elijah, they're going to get beheaded, and the whole world is going to, you know, behold them for three days. Preachers didn't understand. They didn't understand what that verse meant, but they believed it, and they preached it. So we should have the same confidence with this stuff. Okay, the second thing is, why did Jesus prepare us a home in heaven in 14, John 14, 2, if you're not a heavenly citizen already. Does that make sense? Yeah. Can you, I don't think, okay, for, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, so for those of you who are more knowledgeable about this subject, I believe there are countries where you can't even buy a plot of land if you're not their citizen. If you're not a heavenly citizen already, why do you have a property up in heaven right now? It's ready to go. It's like, it's more luxurious and fancy, fancier than any mansion you get down here, but you have it up there. And if the deed is to your name, then you must be a citizen of, of heaven, right? All right. Another question. Why set our affections on things above, according to Colossians 2, if we're not citizens of heaven already? What's the point? If we're citizens down here of the United States, then we would set our eyes on all the money that we can make in this country and all the other stuff that we can do, you know, further our career, whatever you want, right? But why set our affections on things above if you're not already a member of that country up there? It just doesn't, it wouldn't make sense to me. So these are some of the things that I think are helpful to think about. So God is really generous because he gave us, he gave us citizenship to a country that's way better than any country down here. Free of charge. You know how long it took me to get U.S. citizenship? It took me 10 years and a bunch of fees because we have to submit applications. You've got to wait. You've got to do all this stuff. God says, hey, hey skip the line. I, I give you direct approval. You're in, man. You're right there. There you go. You're a citizen. You're a citizen of heaven. You are a heavenly citizen. You may have a passport down here that says U.S., but you know what? Your real passport, the one that you can't see, says heaven on there. There you go. Now, the seventh 
thing that happens after you get saved is that the saved Christian becomes an heir of God and a joint heir with Christ. All right, Galatians 3.29. I'll try to go quickly because uh, I have some other things to cover. But you know what? Things, considering I have like 10 more, I probably can't. I'll try to cover the best of them, okay? Galatians 3.29 says, And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. All right, Romans 8. Uh, I'm turning there with you guys. Romans 8, and we'll look at 17. And I'll just read it here. Sorry, we can't <laughs> turn there in time. Romans 8, 17 says, And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be also glorified together. What an honor. Glorified together with the holiest being in the universe? That's an honor. Now, being an heir of God is quite a status. You ever, you ever hear of those things like, oh, he's the heir to this company. You know, he's the heir to Microsoft, or he's the heir to, you know, Amazon. I don't know if Jeff Bezos has kids, but... He's the heir of the Amazon empire or whatever. You know, we, we give a lot of meaning to those things because they come with power, they come with money, and they come with prestige even, right? But here you're a joint heir with the creator of the universe. You're an heir of God. Like I said, you just got dragged from the slums all the way up to the highest place. Man, that's an awesome status to have. I don't know about you, but that's, that's pretty exciting. It's like... We, we, try to, we try to have, a lot of people try to gain prestige, and, and, uh, and they, the way they do that is some of them will go to a lot of universities and they'll get a bunch of PhDs, MDs, whatever, ABCs you want to put after your name, right? Because they, true, it, it does give you prestige in this world. But we have a title that says, Heir of God, at the end of our name, okay? That's better than any title that you can get down here. You know, I heard from, uh, when I was shadowing a physician back in 2018, I heard that this physician that I was shadowing knew somebody who would take a pay cut of like, what, $600,000 per year just because he wanted to work at Stanford and have prestige. Wow. That's how much some people value prestige. You get it for free. Come on. It doesn't get any better than that. You get it for free. He says, okay, now that you're saved, let me give you this. Let me give you that. Let me give you this. Oh, son, you probably need this too. Hey, let me give you that. It's like, it's like your, your father, the Lord, he took you to a mall and he said, what do you want? Let me give you all this. And you're, you're sitting there like, Lord, I, and you know, your flesh says, Lord, I don't know if I deserve any of this. You know, are, are you sure you want to give this to me? Hey, just take it. I want you to have it. You're my son. Here you go. It's like he, he's got a shopping cart full of stuff and he's, he's adding more on top of it. He's like, this shopping cart is enough. Let's get a truck. And he's filling up the whole truck. And he says, you know what? I'll buy the whole store just for you. That's, that's what I imagine the Lord doing for us because this is a lot of stuff that, I, that isn't because of my merits, yeah. because of what I've done. And I've gotten a lot of free stuff from God just because I'm, you know, I'm his adopted son. That's pretty amazing. That's why I love God. He's, I love him because he first loved, I guess, loved us, I guess. And it's so much that I, can't even, I don't even know what I can do to pay him back. And there is truly nothing you can do to pay him back. But he gives you a chance down here by offering yourselves as a living sacrifice which is your reasonable service. It's, it's, like the, it's like the baseline. It's not even up there. A li being a living sacrifice is the baseline, Paul says. Hey, that's something to think about, right? Last thing, I, last thing I'm going to go over, actually, this is kind of funny. Point eight, or the eighth thing that I'm going to cover is the saved Christian becomes a new creature, but eight is the number of new creation, right? Pretty, pretty interesting. <laughs> I don't know. We just happened to talk about being a new creature here in 8. Anyways, okay, 2 Corinthians 5.17. I have a little banner. Uh, it's not a little banner. It's a pretty big banner. 2 Corinthians 5.17. I have a big banner that says, you know, if any man be in Christ, old, old things are passed away and all things are new. Anyways, I have this verse on a banner that my brother gave me for my birthday, and it's pretty cool. It looks great. Doctor, it's Dr. Ruckman's painting. It's awesome. <laughs> So the Bible says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. If, you're, if you ever feel like the past is holding you back and your flesh or Satan's whispering in your ear and, say, and saying, look at you. And I don't even care if this past was yesterday, okay? Maybe the devil's whispering in your ear and saying, hey, you know what you did last week? You know what you did last month? You really think you can go to church, dress like this, and play the hypocrite and, you know, try to glorify God? How can you do that? You're a wicked sinner. You can't do that. Do what you say, baloney. Yeah. 
God will forgive me of my sins if, I'm, if I confess it to him because he is faithful and just to forgive, all, forgive us of all unrighteousness. Don't let that stuff hold you back. You are a new creature. You're not what you used to be. And the best thing you can do to show that to everybody else is to change. Now, I'm not saying that's a judgment of your salvation, although it's a good indicator. It's a, it's a litmus test. It's, it has a failure rate, okay? <laughs> it's not always accurate. But it does give you a good insight onto what kind of Christian you are. The best thing you can do is to show the world, you know, show forth the light to the, your light to the world. Hey, what's the light in you? That's the Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, God's in me, so let me show some of his light towards you everybody else that don't have God. So you're a new creature. And a lot of these things, changes that I've mentioned so far, tells you that you're a creature like no, not, that has never been created before. You're kind of this weird hybrid creature that's been redeemed from sin, and, and, and you're going to be one of a kind up there. You know, we, only we get the new bodies. The Old Testament saints don't get it as far as I know. We have some exclusive privileges that were never afforded to those in the past and privileges that those in the future won't have in the tribulation and in the millennium. We, can, we, got, we ought to make the best of it. The awesome thing about this verse is that truly when, when a Christian gets saved, many things change. You know, a lot, you see a lot of great men of God. Pastor's dad, he says he, he poured all the alcohol in his house down the drain. You know how expensive some alcohol can be? My parents were talking about alcohol yesterday, and I was like, they don't drink a whole lot, right? Praise God. And they don't, they don't get drunk. Praise God for that. Seriously, I don't know if I could ever handle that. But um, they were talking about how some bottles of alcohol will cost $300 per bottle, and probably even more depending on, I don't know how luxurious you want it. How luxurious can poison get? But, you know... <laughs> <laughs> it's like you're trying to polish up, I won't, I won't say that, but you're, you're trying to polish up some dirt on the floor to make it look nice. It's dirt in the end. Alcohol is poison in the end. But he poured it all down the drain. Why? Because he's a new creature. He said, hey, I can't be the old me anymore. I'm a new creature. I got I to gotta go on as, a, as the new creature that I've been created into. Amen. Right? People have been saved from alcohol addiction. People have been saved from drug addictions. People have been saved from all sorts of addictions. Not only, not only addictions, but their past lifestyles. We got people who are saved from a job that wasn't, you know, that wasn't very Christ-honoring. We have people who have just turned around and said, I don't want to chase money anymore. I want to chase God. That's some amazing stuff. What a change that God can bring in somebody who gets saved. In a sinner that just says, I'm willing to get saved. I'm willing to put my trust in you. That, those are some amazing changes, and we ought, to, we ought to embody that to the fullest. We have to. And the thing I was mentioning about spiritual circumcision earlier is that now that your soul has been cut away from the flesh, it's like Dr. Ruckman describes it as a laser operation that takes place as soon as you get saved. Your soul gets cut away from this wicked, tainted flesh, and now the sins of your flesh cannot bring you down to hell. Man, praise the Lord! That's how He can give us eternal security. It's like, this is like a new technology. Who... Who has ever thought of this stuff? This is like the perfect way to save somebody, yet give him a chance to serve him down here. Wow, I don't know. He's, in my mind, the Lord is a genius creator. Everything he does amazes me. I mean, the fact that I can move my fingers amazes me because if you, if you knew all the stuff that went in behind it, it's, it's amazing. The more I study the body, the more amazed I become at what a creator he is. And the more I study this about what happens after you get saved, the more I'm amazed at the amount of things that he'll give us for free. Amen. It, isn't it funny how people don't want to accept Christ for their salvation? Yeah. Yet, every day you see people, you know, begging on the streets for free stuff, but they won't take the gospel? Yeah. Why is, what is that? It's just, logically speaking, even if you don't see this stuff, if you promise this stuff, I think I would just say, yes, give it to me, please. Yeah. I'm willing to get saved. I want a mansion, you know? I, I want to become a joint heir. I want all, this, all these precious stones and stuff. But that's how this world is. Seeing is believing, right? That's how sad it is. And that's it. Let's uh, close it off with a, pr uh, with a prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for bringing all these people to listen to your word, Lord. I pray that this has been a help and it has exhorted the brethren, Lord. I pray that you'll please fill us up with the Holy Spirit and get us prepared for the next message that is to be preached. 
and that we won't be distracted and that we can commit some things to you, change some things in our lives and be open and receptive to what you have to hear, even if it's something we don't want to hear, Lord. Please keep our hearts and minds fresh for the next service, and I pray that everything that is done here today will be for your glory and that it will edify you and the brethren, Father. In Jesus Christ's almighty name we pray. Amen.